Uh, Luke, uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. You have your bulletins as well. I've got notes on there as well for you to follow along. We're going to move to, through today's message pretty quick. Here we go. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him, what? Deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will what? Lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself or his soul, right? That's a powerful, powerful verse that's um, stuck with me. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, uh, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, thank you for your words today. Thank you for your scriptures. God, please bless your word today. I pray, Lord, that it will change the way we think. It will change what we want. And it will change what we do so that we will be more like you. Please repeat after me. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Sanctifier. Jesus is my Holy Spirit Baptizer. Jesus is my Healer. And Jesus is my soon coming king. Now shout Maranatha. You may be seated. Amen. So uh, today again we've been work, working through the book of Luke. And we are in Luke chapter 9. I asked you this morning, could you read through the book of Luke chapter 9? And I bet you thought it was just going to be a few verses, didn't you? It's a big chapter, isn't it? And there's a lot, a lot going on in Luke chapter 9. In fact, I mean, I think if you only had... Luke chapter 9 to live off of, you could probably live off of that because the gospel's in there and there's a lot in there for your life and living for God. And just a note about that. I've been to places in the world, I know Amar and Pilar here, where they only have a certain books of the Bible. In fact, some places only have certain pages of the Bible because the Bible is illegal, right, in those places or they just don't have access to Scripture. There are real places, many places in the world where that is the case. And so they are living just off of a book of the Bible. And when they find out that maybe another tribe or another location has another book of the Bible, they all get together and share. They memorize these books of the Bible because they are so precious to them. And I even heard one story where a minister says in, in, one, uh, in one country of the world that when uh, pastors or uh, church planters or church leaders get arrested uh, for preaching the gospel, that yeah, they're sad because they had to leave their family and their congregation, but there's also a little bit of excitement because they realize when they go to jail, they'll meet up with other pastors and other leaders who may have memorized other books of the Bible that they've never had access to. And so they look at, so in some places of the world, they measure uh, one's, one's knowledge of ministry, not by how many degrees they have or how many Bible colleges they've been to, but by how many times they've been to jail, right? Because that's where they get a story. That's real, the reality in many places of the world today. In fact, one of the largest, most populated countries of the world. But today we're going to ask some simple questions. Today, again, this is Christianity 101. So if you're new to the faith, good for you. This is basic Christianity. If you've been in the faith a long time, it's good to take a step back, isn't it, to review some of the basics. And that is what we're going to deal with. A lot of it. We're going to ask. The first question is. What is following Jesus, what does it look like? The question is, we need to first find out, who do we follow? Who do we follow? And I'm not going to, of course, it takes your entire faith, your entire Christian life to answer this question, doesn't it, right? Because you're learning more and more about your God and your Savior every step you take in your Christian faith. But there's a lot in chapter 9 that teaches us about who we follow. The first thing we need to know about who we follow is that he is our Savior. Everybody say, Jesus is my Savior. Is my savior. Verse 24 tells us that, doesn't it? It says, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake 
will save it. Jesus is saying right there, I am your Savior. I am the one who can save you. The rest of chapter 9 also talks a lot about who Jesus is. Verse 1, we preached on it last week, but it talks about Jesus as the one who has authority over what? Demons and what else? He has authority over demons and disease, right? He's the one who's greater than any demon or disease. Are you afraid of evil things? Are you afraid of of a disease? Well, you don't need to be. Why? Because if Jesus is in your heart, you have authority in Christ over evil and over diseases. Another thing we need to know about Jesus that we see in Luke chapter 9, you guys get ready. We're going on a roller coaster right now. We're working through Luke 9. Hang in there. Verse 17 is one of my favorite stories of the Bible. The feeding of the what? 5,000, right? The feeding of the 5,000 where Jesus feeds at least 5,000. Of course, there's children and women there, so it's more than 5,000. But here we see Jesus as the one who gives endless and abun- overabundant supply of all that we need. Here's a guy saying, listen, I know what you need. He knew those 5,000, they needed to eat, right? He says, listen, I am the one who supplies your every need. Guess what, church? The one that we're following, if you're following Jesus, not only is he the one that gives you authority over disease and demons, but he also gives you everything you could ever need. I wouldn't say want, right? Because there's certain things I don't really need that I don't need that I want, right? But he is the one that will supply for your every need. If you're lacking something, if something's missing, stop going there, going there, stop complaining, stop blaming. Go to the God, your Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the one who can supply your every need. According to Peter's confession in verse 20, look at that with me. Peter, when asked, Who do you say that I am? What did Peter say? He says, you are the Christ, uh, the, the Christ of God, right? Well, there's this, this story appears uh, in Matthew as well. And in Matthew 16, 16, uh, let me read that text to you. It says, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And listen to what Jesus said. Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my Father who is in heaven. This is one of the first instances in Scripture where we see someone making a confession of faith. And Jesus is saying, listen, you didn't come to that knowledge on your own. There's no way, there's no way you figured that out in yourself, right? You have come to the, God has granted you that understanding for you to sit there and acknowledge me for who I am. That is from God and God alone. Well, guess what, church? You are here today and you've declared Jesus as your Savior. You've been baptized in water. You've surrendered your life to God. Guess what? You didn't come to that knowledge on your own. God gave you that knowledge. God looked at your life and he knew you would handle that knowledge correctly. And God revealed that to you. He is Christ, the Son of God. Who else are we following? Not only are we following the one that gives us victory over demons, diseases, the one that gives us an endless and abundant supply, the one who is Christ, the son of the living God. Uh, But in verse 22, he says, he is the son of man who would die and resurrect to life in three days. Look at that verse. It says, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. He is the son of man. To you, maybe that doesn't mean a lot to you, but if you were a Jew and you were living in that day and you were looking for the great Messiah, Jesus is saying, I am that Messiah. I am the one who is the king you are waiting for. And that's a big deal because one day we'll appreciate that more when we're, when, when, when we're living in a place where Jesus Christ is king. where we, He is king now, but that time when uh, he will establish his throne and we will behold that. Not only is he that, but he's also the one who's coming in glory. Look at verse 26. He says, for whoever is ashamed of me in my words and of him will the son of man be ashamed when he comes in his what? 
glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Are you paying attention? Because this Jesus, he is Christ, the Son of God. He is the one that has all authority. He is the one that right now, right here, is supplying everything that you need. But he's also the one we're waiting for because he's going to appear in glory in the clouds and he's going to come and establish his throne. He's coming, folks. Hang in there. Hang in there. I know things are broken. I know you wish... That People would act better and do better things, right? But we're waiting for the one who will come in glory. If we keep reading, too, we'll find out, or the previous chapter, which we've already preached, he's the one that has power of the storms. Uh, he causes the wind and the rain and the waves to, to uh, calm. He has power over death. When he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, he has power to deliver from the, even the worst evil. When he delivered the demoniac, he has power to heal the worst of diseases. When he healed the lady with the issue of blood for 12 years, this is who he is. This is who you're following. If you're going to pick somebody to follow, follow him, right? He's the one who's proven that he is Christ, he is God, he is king, he is all-powerful, he is almighty, he's the one who's coming back. Think about who you're following. Think about the people in your life you want to be like. I want to, be, I want to follow this guy. I want to follow Jesus. And if you keep reading in verse 28, chapter 9, verse 28, there's a story about him transfiguring, right? Where Peter, James, and John, they go up on Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is a great big mountain. And there, uh, Jesus is, he looks one way to them, right? And they know Jesus is he, he's who he is, right? They've seen his power. They've seen his glory. But on top of the mountain, Jesus changes. He transfigures into something that's even greater than he was before. Now, I don't know who God is to you right now. I know who he is to me. And I can tell you that I knew of a religious Jesus. I knew mom and dad's Jesus. And I knew a Jesus that we sang songs to and we went to church about. But there was a moment in my life. It was, it was April 7th, 1997, when God transfigured before me. And I realized this God was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I'm going to follow this guy because this guy is true. He is real. He is the Son of God. And if you're here today and you're struggling to follow Jesus, you're struggling, right, to follow him and to trust him, I'm asking you, will you pray, dear God, transfigure before me. Show me your glory. Show me your greatness. Show me your beauty. Put the fear of God in me. God will do that. He'll answer that prayer. He'll answer. He's still transfiguring before me. He's still revealing new things about him that I didn't know before. If you're stuck in your faith, if your faith is boring, if Jesus is the same to you as he was five years ago, you better climb up that mountain. You better get close to God because he wants to show you a new side of his glory. That's a sermon of his own right there, isn't it? What does following then look like? We know who we're following. But what does following look like based on the text that we open today's message. Well, here we're following not a religion, not an ideology, not a politic, right? Not, a, not, not, not morality or an ethic, right? And, no, what Jesus is saying here is follow me. Follow a person. A me is a personal pronoun. He identifies as a me. Right? He identifies as a he, him. I know it's not funny to joke with, is it? He said, no, he's a person. He identifies with a personal pronoun and he is saying, hey, listen, follow me. When Jesus is saying follow, we are following a person. We are having an active personal relationship with Jesus Christ, a real being, a real personable being. And it's not a buddy relationship. I, I, please deal with me. When I start talking about this, uh, treating this Jesus as he's my buddy Jesus. Now, I know there's a text, right? It talks about, you know, he's a friend, right? I get that. He does. God desires. He's not my buddy. He's my God. He's my Lord. He's my king, right? Right? He's, he's somebody that. Double kind of relationship. Hey, Jesus, you know, listen, I know your number. Right, I, I daily walk and talk with Jesus. number one relationship.
what, what does following Jesus look like as well? What does it mean to follow Jesus? And the text goes on in verse 23. It says, if anyone... Pay attention to those words, how it's, how it's even worded in English. I think the English does a good job. If anyone would come after me. He's telling us that we need to lose. We need to lose our life. What does he mean by that? What is the definition of losing one's life? And the first part of that definition is Jesus is saying, will anyone who would come after me, who will be, who will be beneath me? Who will be second place, right? Who will make me first place? Who, who will take the other relationships and, and put them behind me? Who will make me first in their life? Who will come after me, Jesus is saying. Losing means we have to let him become number one and first place in our life. Verse 24 says, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man that he gains the whole world, but yet forfeits his soul? Greek word here, apulamai, uh, or ap- apo, uh, which is the word to lose, uh, or to, really it's also the word to uh, die. It's Jesus is saying who will, uh, it's, it's, the lose, it's the word to perish, it's the word to, to lose a sheep, right? Uh, if you were to lose something. So in the English, it, it lines up really well within the Greek. But really what Jesus is trying to say is that who will allow their life in this world to uh, lose what, everything that you have and say, I, 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 I forfeit it all. I think one of the songs we sang this morning talked about that, didn't it? I would give it all to you, God. I just want Jesus. I just want Jesus. I, you can have all the rest of it. You can have the money. You can have, you can have the, the property. You can have my dreams. I just want, I lose it all for you, God. And that's the type of relationship that God is asking for each of That's what following, that's the definition of following is saying, Lord, I lose my life in order to gain yours. Romans chapter 6, verse 11, a popular baptism scripture. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's what it means to be saved. I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to all these dreams and things that I wanted for me, myself, and I. Everything that was going to make me look good, feel good, and better than everybody else. That's the way I used to live. But when I got saved, now it's everything about what makes him look good, whatever brings glory to him, right? Whatever exalts Jesus. That's now the life. I lost the old life and the new life I'm living for him. And listen, it's a losing. It's not just a one-time thing. Now, it happened, right, on April 7th, 1997. I lost it, right? I did. I said it was a moment I had with God. And I'm like, you know what? This is worth it. This is worth dying for, right? Losing my life for this guy, Jesus Christ. But on that day, I was still holding on to a lot of stuff, right? I mean, I thought it and I desired it, but I was so, eh, well, you know what? I still kind of like kind of doing my own thing. I like having my own relationships. I like, and, but it, 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 it's, it's a process. It's a daily, what? Dying. And, and I'm a lot more dead today than I was 10, 15 years ago. I'm a lot more dead today even than I was a year ago. That's a daily walk, a daily surrendering and sacrificing to the Lord. But it gets me to the uh, third point here. And this is the, most in, the part that, that applies the most to our life. How then do we follow Christ? If we know who we're following and we know what it means to follow, then the, what's the how? How do I follow Jesus? Because I want to get it right. Are you there with me? Do you want to get it right? Do you truly want to follow God? Right? If you're here because you want to be a good church member, you're in the wrong, wrong place. If you're here because you want to be religious, you're in the wrong place. You're not going to get good church member messages. You're not going to get good religious messages, right? You are going to get messages on what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And that is what we, I want to get right because if I'm following Jesus, he's going to lead me to eternal life. If I'm following religion or even church, that can lead me right off the cliff. I want to follow Jesus and I want to get it right. And Jesus answers that question specifically. He nails it down. He says, this is what it means to follow me. He says, and he said to all, verse 23, if anyone would come after me, let him what? Deny himself 
and take up his cross daily and follow me. Deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Let's talk about denying oneself. And almost every translation uses that term, denying oneself, right? That is uh, across the board, universal, uh, except for one translation that I never use. I don't even like using this translation just because it's, uh, I mean, my kids say cringy. It's a little cringy, right, sometimes, right? And it says this, though, but I kind of like it. I like what it has to say. It's the New Living Translation. If you're using the New Living Translation, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to belittle you in no way. It's a good translation. But the New Living Translation says, Give up your own way. I kind of like that. Deny yourself. Give up your own way. Because I was on my own way. I was doing my own thing. I was living my own life, right? I was making the decisions. I was doing whatever I felt like doing. I was doing what everybody else was doing. I was living my own way until Jesus came into my life. And even when Jesus came into my life, I was still trying to do my own thing, right? But, I, but somebody was bothering me. Somebody was saying, no, Chris, it's the wrong way. You're doing the wrong thing. You need to do it this way. You need to turn around. You need to go in a different direction. And that's what denying oneself is. It's giving up on our own way. The Amplified Version says to set aside one's selfish interest. Contemporary Version also says to forget about yourself. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're listening to this. Chris, that sounds, that sounds extreme Christianity. That doesn't sound like what I said yes to, right? That doesn't sound like what I hear when I look on TV when I'm hearing those preachers. What you're telling me is, is I need to give it all up. And that's what Jesus is saying. I'm just giving you his words. That's what Jesus... Are, are you willing to deny yourself to... To give up on your own way to follow Jesus. That's the question each of us have to ask ourselves. The literal Greek here, the literal Greek says to disown yourself. Disown yourself. That's tough. Jesus made a lot of mouths drop when he said these scriptures. Like, we're reading it now, and we're like, oh, we've heard this already. We've already heard messages preached on this. But can you imagine? Can you imagine hearing that for the first time? Are you serious, Jesus? I have to give up everything. I have to disown myself. I have to give up on my own way. I have to deny myself. I have to lose. I have to die. Jesus is like, yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's tough stuff. This means I need to lose all rights to my life at this point. I don't have a right to get upset. I don't have a right to get revenge. I don't have a right to hold a grudge. I don't have a right to talk about how I want to. I don't have a right to talk about others the way I want to. I don't have a a right to walk the way I want to. I don't have a, a, a right to befriend who I want to. I don't have a right to entertain myself the way I want to. I don't have a right to make as much money as I want to. I have to disown myself. Now I have to do it his way. I have to follow his plan. I have to give up on my own way. Woo. Hey, I'm just as shocked as you guys are. I didn't want to preach this. I really, really didn't. Oh, boy, I'm glad I did. Because I need to be reminded. It's not about Chris. It's not about everything I want, everything that makes me feel good, look good. And better than everybody else. I have to check my life to this text. I have to submit myself to these scriptures. Lord, is there any way in me that I still own? Come on, church. That's a prayer. Lord, is there anything in my life that I still own? Oh, God, search me. Is there something I'm holding on to? And I'm saying, God, you can have all that. But this, Lord, I'm going to hold on to it just for a little while longer. Because it makes me feel good. It makes me look good. It makes me better than everybody else. Oh, Lord, I've given you so much. Why do you want this too? And God is saying, "Mm -mm -mm, I want that too, Chris. I want that too. Am I holding on to a hurt? Am I holding on to a desire? Am I holding on to a dream? Am I holding on to a relationship? Am I holding on to a lifestyle that I know that I have no right to own? We got to ask ourselves these really important questions. Help me, Lord, to disown everything in order to give you ownership of all. That is what denying oneself is. This book here, 
We'll give you the details. That's why it's so important. He said daily, right? Daily, daily, daily. You've got to be in this book. You have to study this book. This book will help you know what you're holding on to. I held on to something this week. This week I had to, I had to submit to this text. Even before I prepared for this message, there was something I was holding on to. And trust me, God and I, I know he's right. <laughs> I know he's right. I'm trying to talk him out of it, right? I'm trying to convince him that he's not, right? I'm not winning this battle. He's winning it, of course, you know. But I'm even something in my own life, and it's my business. I'm not going to share it with you because it's juicy gossip, and I don't want you talking about me. What is the pastor up to? I can't believe he's standing up in the pulpit. He's got juicy gossip. Give it up. Got to give it up. What, how else does, what else does, uh, how else do we follow? And the second part of that is that we have to take up our cross. Take up our cross. This is probably the hardest, the hardest part of this entire message. Verse 23 says, take up his cross, what? Daily, daily, again, daily is such a big word in this whole message, isn't it? It's not a Sunday Take up your cross on Sunday. Yeah, I can do that. Jesus is saying, no, you've got to take up your cross daily. Daily. And what does this mean? Well, first of all, this is, this is some heavy, hard teaching, right? I've got the cross here for you today. And uh, if you think about it, Jesus is saying daily, wake up, right? You get out of bed. Oh, man, I'm going to hurt myself. May's not going to be here till Tuesday or Monday night, so she can't help me, right? So I'm here to pick up my cross. <laughs> and this is not very comfortable. This is, this is heavy. This is heavy. And especially, they don't even know how heavy it is until Jesus will eventually die on this thing, right? And then they'll be reminded of what he was talking about when their sins were on that cross, right? That Jesus had to pay the penalty for their sins. And so not only is it heavy physically, it's heavy spiritually. It, it's, it's heavy emotionally because I realize, right, that, that I can't do this on my own. I need God's help and that I'm in this battle with myself and it's not, I'm not going to overcome sin by just trying to fix it myself through religious efforts or means. The only way I can fix my sin is if I take up my cross daily, right? If I, try, if I, if I get up tomorrow, I'm like, you know what? I don't need the cross of Jesus in my life. I can do this on my own. Then um, I'm only going to wreck my life. But I have to pick up every day. I've got to pray that prayer that I asked you to pray, right? Lord, search my heart. Is there anything offensive in me? Have I said anything, done anything, thought anything, desired something that was offensive towards you, right? And so it's heavy spiritually, it's heavy emotionally, it's heavy physically, right? It is not hard every single day to open up your text and let God's word search your heart and reveal things to you that maybe you don't want to know about yourself or to tell you that, you know what, you don't have any right to feel that way towards that person. Or you know what, that relationship is not good for you. Or maybe God's word saying, you know what, I've got another plan for your finances. And so it's a heavy cross to bear in your life but God is saying listen this is how you follow me not only do you make me first not only do you deny yourself but you got to carry this cross everywhere you go but you know what else about this cross not only is it heavy but it's humbling it's humble isn't it because when you're carrying this you can't go to certain places that everybody else is going to <laughs> You can't live their life, can you? Because if you show up at a party with this thing on your shoulders, they're going to look at you and laugh you out and tell you to go home. You can't have certain relationships. People are going to ridicule you. They're going to say, why are you carrying that cross? Life is easier when you just let that thing go, when you live the way we live. We have so much more fun. And it's humbling. You can't have the relationships you used to have. Your life is very different. Not only is it hard, but it's humbling. But Jesus says, if you take up this cross and follow me, then you will save your life. You will save your life. It brings me to a story I once heard, um, probably very early in my faith. And I'm probably going to tell you, you probably have heard this illustration before. Um, 
Now, let me just make one more thing, and I talked about it a little bit earlier in the message. You carry this around, people will attack you. People will attack you. They will attack you. They will call you all kinds of names. They will try to shut you up. They will try to put you in prison. People every single day around the world are dying and going to prison and being attacked. Their character is being attacked. Their families are being attacked because they carry this thing around. Now, is God with them? Absolutely. Is, it, is, is God protecting them in, in, in certain ways? Absolutely. Are they going to go and live eternally in heaven? Absolutely. The attackers, are they going to go to heaven? Some might, but most of them will not. So we will get the last, I shouldn't say laugh because that's very insensitive, but in, in reality, you know, they'll wish they had not attacked. But here's a story I want to kind of leave you with. It's a, a story that I heard when I was very young in the faith about following Jesus and carrying the cross. I hope I get it right. Some of you have heard this, this story before and you're going to say, Chris, you got, got it wrong. I couldn't find it anywhere online. But one day the Lord called out to his disciples to pick up their crosses and to come up to him on the mountain. Peter because everybody picks on Peter. We're going to pick on Peter. But Peter picked up his cross and thought, wow, this is a heavy cross. And I'm going, I, I've got to walk up this mountain carrying this big 20 foot long cross on my shoulders. He says, I'm going to hang out in the back of the crowd and trim mine down a little bit to take off some of the weight. So he did. The other disciples got ahead of him. He trimmed it up a little bit. So that's, this is a lot lighter than it was. But then as he got further up the mountain and the mountain got even steeper, he thought, you know what, I'm going to trim it down some more uh, because it's still too heavy. And he did. He trimmed it out, down even some more. And he did that several times going up this mountain. And finally he said, you know what, this is just way too heavy. I'm going to do, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, this cross and I'm going to chisel it till it's basically a cross that I can wear around my neck and put on a necklace. <laughs> And that's exactly what he did, right? He made a cross necklace, the first cross necklace ever, right? Uh, before they were popular and cool. And then they finally get up to the top of the mountain. And when he gets up there with the other disciples, he notices that there is a big gorge between them, the, the mountain that Jesus is on and the mountain that they're on. And it's a 20-foot gorge. And so the disciples are taking their, their cross and they're putting it down and walking across their cross to be with Jesus. And Peter gets up there, he's got the cross around his neck. He's like, uh-oh, <laughs> uh-oh, this cross around my necklace is not going to get me to heaven, right? And I don't know, as a kid, that really stuck with me because I thought, man, I've wore a cross around my neck for so long thinking, you know what, look how religious I am. Everybody knows I'm a believer. I wear a cross around my neck thinking that Jesus in heaven is looking down. Oh, I'm so proud of my son. He's wearing a cross that represents who I am when all the long, that isn't the cross that Jesus wanted me to wear in my life, right? Jesus wanted me to take up that cross. He wanted me every single day to walk in his shoes, to suffer with him, to deny myself, to, to, to live his life, to follow him, to put him first in my life, to lose myself, to deny myself, to take up my cross, right? To disown myself. And that's the life he's calling each and every one of us. Now, I'm getting better. I don't want to say I'm getting better at it. It's, it's still as hard as it ever was. But you know what? I'm finding out as I do get older in Jesus that I can trust him more and more because, again, he is the one that's greater than any uh, disease or demon. He is the one that's the king of kings and coming back in glory. He is the one that has, has given me joy and given me peace. He is my comforter. I can trust him more, and I'm learning each day more and more that I can carry my cross, I can disown myself and lose, and God has been faithful, and God has helped me so, so much. It is impossible to do on your own, but it's not impossible for God. It's not impossible for God. I want to close out this morning. And again, I know this is basic Christianity. I know each and every one of us have heard messages like this numerous times. But some of you, this may be the first time you're hearing this. Some of you may have said, Pastor, I didn't realize that God was really asking for everything. I remember when I was in college and I, got, I was confused about, you know, salvation is free. You know, what does that really mean? And I remember my professor saying, salvation is free, but it's not cheap. Salvation is free, but it not, it's, it's not cheap because it costs you your life. 
It's free, absolutely. You don't have to do any religious thing or you don't have to uh, do any certain religious rituals or you don't monitor. You have to give God your life. Surrender your life to God. I thought, wow. Did I do that? Am I doing that? So many people miss it, folks. They would rather pay the religious price. They would rather do the religious works. They'd rather say, okay, I went to church on Sunday. Okay, I did this religious thing. Okay, I, I, I didn't. Wait. And it's all about, hey, at least I'm not as bad as this guy. And that's what they're hoping will get them into heaven. But Jesus is saying, no. The only way you can get to heaven very end of the text another way we follow Jesus is to not be ashamed nobody's ashamed right nobody's ashamed of Jesus in this room I hope not but who are you when you leave this room who are you I have to ask myself that sometimes sometimes I just want nobody to find out that I'm a believer and follower of Jesus but his word says, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the son of man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the father and of his holy angel. Again, basic Christianity. Have I disowned everything? Am I not ashamed of Christ in my life? Am I carrying my cross daily? Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord.